Okay, so um, first of all, I'm not a professor of game design. Yes, excuse me. <laughs> I'm a professor of computer graphics and um, I know a bit of game design. Um, and then Uta asked me to give this talk and told me the title, Aspects of Game Development and Game Design. I said, wow, um, this is going to be a long talk. Um, so, and then knowing about the, the, um, the purpose of this workshop, so namely that uh, Logjam workshop, I said, okay, game development, all this technological stuff um, that translators and localizers have, localizers, localizers? localizers? Um, have to do in this context, um, they know already, or they get to know um, in the workshop uh, taught by Uta. So I will concentrate on more or less the game design aspect, or one game design aspect, um, so in the course of the next uh, hour or so, um, what we're going to cover is, um, first of all, we're going to try to understand what a game is. Well, probably everybody knows what a game is. Um, but I edited this to what a game is all about. So what is the most important part of a game? Um, and we're going to talk about the most important elements of a game. and. Uh, we're actually going to see that, see that um, games is all about fun. Now everybody knows what fun is. Really? Do you know what fun is? Um, well, um, I'm, I'm going to try to um, explain a bit what fun is in the context of, of games and to, uh, to explain a bit uh, different kinds of fun which are important for games. Um, not only important for the game as a whole, but also um, for the language being used in games. Um, this is going to be my, uh, my fourth and last part. Um, we're going to look at um, how language can provide fun in games. Uh, and this is basically what, what your task is going to be at the, um, in the, um, the, context, uh, the contest. Um, you're going to localize a game, but uh, I'm going to try to show you that localization is more than just translating. Um, what, is being, what is said in the game and so on. Um, before we start, a few words about the examples I've chosen to, to use in my talk. Um, they all stem from games that I have played, I'm playing, I, I will be playing, well, actually I started playing but, but stopped. Um, uh, and they might not uh, be, it might not be general consensus that what, what I'm going to show with these examples, but I think, uh, well, to, to my understanding, is um, that these examples are kind of well illustrate what I'm going um, to tell you. So um, if you don't know the games, um, feel free to play them. <laughs> Otherwise, um, just look them up or whatever. Um, it's not about the games, it's more about the, the content. Okay, um, let's start with uh, what is a game. And um, with the question of what is a game, I'm borrowing from two of my actually favorite books in this, uh, in this area. First one is uh, by Jane McGonagall. No, her name is not Minerva. Um, <laughs> and there's an I in her name. Um, so uh, the first book is by Jane McGonagall, Reality is Broken. Um, I think everybody who uh, does something with games should to read this book. It's really great. And her obviously very short definition of a game is um, games are unnecessary obstacles we volunteer to tackle. So what does this have to do with games? Well, actually, she is explaining it uh, in a fairly lengthy chapter. Um, and she actually defines four different um, main, or four different points that are um, uh, really important for games. First is the goal. Every game has to have a goal, every game has to have something that um, the player hopes to achieve by playing the game. So, um, free the princess, um, save the planet, uh, collect um, candies, whatever. Build a city. Um, then we have rules. Um, rules as the second important part, or the second most important part, uh, kind of place limitations on how the player can achieve his goals. Okay? Free the princess. Um, if this is the, the house where the princess is in, there is an open door, you go in, grab the princess, and you have uh, at least three. Um, would not be fine. So um, there are restrictions, there are limitations, um, there are these restrictions and limitations in achieving the goal uh, 
are defined within the rules. Um, the third point is a feedback system um, that tells the player every moment in time how far he or she is away from reaching the goal. Um, so the player is always uh, always has knowledge of um, what is he doing right now, what is the state of the game world, whatever, um, and how far is he away, he away from freeing the princess. Um, and the fourth and um, probably most interesting part in um, this definition is voluntary participation. Um, voluntary participation means that um, everyone who's playing a game does not have to play a game. Um, he, he or she does it voluntarily. Um, he, voluntary, he or she voluntarily accepts the rules, accepts um, the goals, and accepts the, um, the feedback. And only um, if this is the case, then um, there is there's fun in playing the game. So, um, it has nothing to do with video games, it has nothing to do with computers at all, um, but it's probably a very interesting uh, definition of game. And the second one, which is closer to video games, stems from um, Ralph Costa, who um, wrote a book named called The Theory of Fun for Game Design. Um, well, kind of contradictory theory and fun, but um, you will see it works. Um, and he defines explicitly, he explicitly defines a video game as an interactive experience um, that provides the player with an increasingly challenging sequence of patterns which he or she learns and eventually masters. So um, there are a few key terms in this uh, definition. Um, the first one is interaction. Every game is an interaction between player and game, or players, uh, imagine a, car, a card game where you don't have a, uh, like a computer to play with, so, um, then you interact with your co-players and you interact with the cards. But anyway, interaction is pretty important for, um, for any game. Um, the second thing that's, that's really important is challenge. Um, games only work if players are challenged. To, to reach a goal, uh, if players are challenged to, to do something, and if players can overcome challenges, this uh, brings us back to uh, Jamie Gunnigan's definition, yeah, um, unnecessary burdens, burdens? Uh, obstacles, okay, um, yeah, an, an obstacle is a challenge. Um, and the third point, and this is in this uh, definition the most important one, um, is learning and mastery. And um, Ralph Costa himself says in, said in one of his talk, learning and mastering are at the heart of what we call fun. Now, there are mostly students here. Learning and fun. Um, there is no, you do all blank faces. Learning and fun, blank faces. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, <laughs> when you read it, learning is fun, but when you do it, we have fun. Um, so, what, what is, why is, is that so important? And um, Ralph, Costa, Ralph Costa actually uh, comes to the conclusion that, that fun is the, the most important thing in video games. And actually, uh, humans are, even if you don't believe it, humans are driven by the eagerness to learn new things. Um, humans are driven by the eagerness to, to improve themselves, to improve their knowledge, to improve um, their skills. And, um, Learning, improving, does not actually mean that you have to learn like, quantum physics or relativity theory, uh, or you have to learn a completely new language. Um, learning is um, every single new thing that you encounter during the day. Um, if you get something new, you learn something. And actually there's a biochemical reaction um, uh, appearing in your body, there is um, a, a dopamine, is, is, or the, the release of dopamine is increased, and dopamine is the, uh, one of the hormones who is um, actually known to um, make you feel well, um, <laughs> basically. Um, and actually, that is, uh, this sentence, fun is a neurochemical reward to, uh, to encourage, us, encourage us to keep trying. Um, and what actually happens is you end up in a spiral. Uh, you learn something, you, you get something new, um, dopamine is released, um, you, have, you have fun, um, you start to, okay, this, is, this was a good thing, I want to have more of this. 
Um, and so you try to, to learn more, um, get more, uh, improve more, and so on. Um, and so fun is basically the emotional response for learning and um, to bring it to one simple sentence, fun is just another word for learning. So, um, all your students here. Uh, fun is just another word for learning. Um, even if it is relativity theory, quantum physics, or um, computer science, or mathematics. Fun is just another word for learning. Um, and in games, fun arises out of mastery. So you, you do your task, you, at some point in time, you know how to, uh, to solve that problem. Um, you learned how to solve the problem, you're feeling well, um, you're trying again, and you're doing it better, and so on. So it arises out of mastery, out of comprehension, um, and uh, with games, so Ralph Costa, learning is the drug, and actually dopamine. Um, if we're talking about dopamine, dopamine has a lot of do with, uh, with drugs and um, the uh, with perception of, of drugs. And so, um, fun, is, is, it's all about fun. And y yes, games is all about fun. Um, nobody would voluntarily engage in activities that are not fun. Would you? <laughs> uh, well, you would. If I would pay your money. Um, but but this, is, this is a different story. Um, fun is um, intrinsic motivation. Um, fun um, comes from, from inside of your body, from inside of your mind. Um, and you yourself are motivated to do something. Well, I could motivate, motivate you externally, so-called in, uh, extrinsic motivation. I could, I could pay your money for, for doing some stupid things. Um, <clears throat> well, you would do it, but not because it's fun, but just because uh, you get the money. So extrinsic motivation, that's a totally different um, different topic here, and I'm not going to um, go into detail here, but nobody would play a game that isn't fun. Um, and I can be sure that this is, this is true. Um, so, I'm not going to ask you the question, what is fun? Because um, we have like 30, 40 people in this room here. Um, if I would ask everybody uh, what is fun, then I would get like 30, 40 answers. Um, actually, um, there is no general consensus of what is fun, but in the context of game design, in the context of, um, yeah, in the context of games, um, there are a few, well, general um, things that are required, uh, not required, uh, regarded as fun. And actually, Marc Leblanc, one of the, uh, one kind of well-known game designer, um, came up with a taxonomy of so-called game pleasures. He came up with, with eight terms, um, Sensation, fantasy, narrative, challenge, fellowship, um, discovery, expression, and submission, um, which are, in his uh, point of view, the most important so-called game pleasures. Um, and we're going to go through all of these uh, eight uh, game pleasures now, um, more or less away from languages, but also with a kind of a point of view on, on language. Um, and you will see uh, what they mean and why they are fun. Okay, number one, sensation. Sensation. Um, right. Pretty cool. Um, if you have, an, uh, have a video game and you have stunning graphics, um, you could possibly play that game just because of the graphics. Yeah. Music, the same. If you have a video game with it, which has really great music, you could possibly play the game just because of graphics and good music. I want to show you one example. Um, But um, it is, it is a three minutes piece, so. Um, but 
and, and you couldn't actually see the graphics um, so nicely. But um, Final Fantasy XIV has um, astounding graphics. If you're, it's it's not that every nitty gritty detail is, is very very uh, very nice, but like as a whole, you come into that world and you say, wow. And then you have this, this orchestral sound in um, every region, a different uh, piece of music, um, which changes from night to day, and uh, you always have these, this pretty nice music composed by one of the um, best uh, video game composers um, and uh, performed by uh, a symphony orchestra. And this is just for sensation, or in an essential um, aspect, this is just great. And, and actually, I happen to play, it's an, it's an MMORPG, and I happen to play in this game just walking around for, for half an hour, just walking around through this world, um, looking at the scenery and listening to the music. And actually I have this game open in the background just to have the music running, sometimes. Um, but sensation is also language. Um, the next example <coughs> um, is from a game newly released uh, a few months ago by a small um, company located in Halle. Um, they uh, made a game um, and they uh, actually um, have a very, very uh, nice speaker um, who uh, did the whole voice acting. And the part I'm showing you now um, is just the voice acting. Usually there is, a, normally there is some music underneath, but I could only get the, the voice acting, so um, it doesn't sound as good as in-game, but um, just just listen to the wordings and listen to the words you choose and listen to the to the accent. Um. Beyond the human world was a hidden realm where the gods dwelled. Among these most powerful beings lived tiny creatures whose playfulness wouldn't let you believe they were gods at all. My story is about them. Foxes. Innocent spirits enjoying their lives in blissful immortality until the corruption ripped them apart from each other. So when I this is the game I will be playing. Um, <laughs> so when when I start the game and uh, this is the the intro sequence. It's actually the um, the first few sentences in the game. Um, a bit music underneath and I, wow, um, I actually. Um, I was shivering by this, this, this sound and this, this words. Um, and I, I, I know the person, or I know one of the persons who, who worked in that game, I just told her, this is so great, and, and your, your intro uh, sequence is... Really... Yeah, but language, this is also a um, sensation. What's more is tactile feedback. Uh, if you play board games and you do uh, the, the haptics, you have these uh, figurines or whatever. Um, or movement, um, if you think about playing with Kinect or, or, or Wii. So, uh, sensation means uh, altogether games need to provide rich sensory input. Um, otherwise, it's not fun. Number two, fantasy. Um, fantasy uh, means that you build up um, a consistent fantasy world from uh, what you saw in the game, what you read in the text, what you heard in the, in the audio, and uh, what you experience in the world. Um, basically, fantasy makes you imagining yourself somebody uh, who you are not. <coughs> no, I'm not that guy. Um, obviously not. If I, I mean, if I would run around here like this, uh, <laughs> it would probably be fine, but um, uh, I'm not that guy, but I'm playing that guy. And um, sometimes in game, um, and this, I, I, I'm, it's, it depends on, on the, uh, the kind of um, or the, the amount of uh, escapism, and that is called here, um, like how far I'm able to escape the real world um, depends on how I, how I play. Um, either I see this guy as somebody I'm controlling, or I see this guy as that's me playing. So um, fantasy um, enables me to um, dive into the game world and say, okay, this is this is me, um, this is a famous black mage who um, killed all those creatures, um, who is the warrior of light, um, who is uh, with his friends, um, who, who actually can save that world. Um, and and I, I, feel, I kind of feel the eager to do so. But, um, but 
only happens if there is, there is uh, space for imagination. It only happens if there is room to let me think about what I'm doing, um, to let me actually uh, fantasize about, okay, this is the world I'm living in. Um, number three, um, narrative. Narrative or story. Um, games usually tell stories. Games have to tell stories. That's what games are for. Um, games tell stories in two, in two different ways. First way is um, there's this prescribed or prescribed linear or non-linear way, which is um, defined for development in um, the game design, uh, which is told by cutscenes, it's told by dialogues, it's told by text boxes, and so on. Like you see in the, in the upper image is a um, in-game cutscene with some dialogue boxes where you get some um, some additional information. Um, but narrative is more than just this predefined story. Narrative is also the story that you as a player experience um, in a sequence of dramatic um, encounters of uh, dramatic events or a dramatic sequence of events. So let's 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 see the, the, the lower image. Um, this is no cutscene, this is a regular in-game shot. Um, this this guy uh, suddenly showed up in the world and um, a few people around, okay, um, there is this dramatic event, this guy showed up, uh, we have to do something about him. Um, and this is a kind of story that evolves just by the events that happen to, to occur in the game. Not just in uh, role-playing games, not just in adventure games, not just in, um, in MMORPGs or whatever, but also in, um, in any other games. There are events and you yourself uh, make a story out of it. Um, that enriches the story which is, which is given by the game itself. Um, and there also could be completely made up stories. Um, if, you, uh, if you know about the um, MMORPG uh, scene, there, there's a big role playing scene um, of gamers who actually imagine being somewhere else and uh, doing uh, really great things to actually live their, their second lives in, in that game. Uh, so games should tell a story. I said should, but actually games need to tell a story. Okay, number four, challenge. Um, challenge is uh, the first point, or the first aspect, where we um, obviously learn in games. Um, and actually the core of every game is a problem to be solved. Solve, save the princess, um, uh, yeah. Rescue the princess, um, save the planet, uh, whatever. Uh, connect the candies. Um, <laughs> um, so every problem, and uh, my students know that I uh, usually say there are no problems, there are only challenges. Uh, every problem actually is a challenge. Um, a problem is, is the negative word for challenge. Um, you have a challenge that you're going to overcome, um, that you're going to tackle. And um, this is actually the most motivating aspect in games. This is the um, challenge, is, this is, that's the game pleasure, number four. Um, it's actually the most motivating. And for uh, lots of players, this is the only and the uh, motivating um, aspect in games. They want to have challenges. They, they want to have epic fights. They want to have um, epic enemies um, whatsoever. They want to kill these enemies, fight these enemies. Um, and uh, why is it so? Well, mastering a challenge leads to positive emotion. Everybody knows, um, students for example, mastering a challenge, yeah? passing an exam, um, is mastering a challenge. Passing an exam for the second time is remastering a challenge. No. Um, passing an exam is mastering a challenge and you're feeling good afterwards. You're feeling great afterwards. You could dance, actually. Um, this is a lot of positive emotion that comes out of mastering the challenge, um, but only um, if that challenge was A, challenging enough, and B, not too challenging. So the level of the challenge has, kind of has to match your, your level of experience, your level of, um, your level of knowledge and skill. So um, if you would have to write an exam uh, about quantum mechanics, if I stick with this example from the beginning, um, that challenge would be too high, and uh, you would probably fail the exam. Um, 
which would not most 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 of us I said probably most of you would prob okay most of you would probably fail the exam um, and uh, you would not have any positive emotions afterwards I mean I mean if you pass the exam um, <laughs> then the, the positive the positive emotion would, uh, would be so great so big but anyway so games should be challenging um, not challenging games are not fun. Number five, fellowship. Um, playing games has always been um, a social activity, is a social activity, and will always be a social activity. Um, playing games, in the beginning of uh, playing games, uh, people were sitting at home with their family, a few cards in their hands, or a few whatever pieces of wood, and uh, playing games. And playing games was the best uh, way of socializing. Um, with the advent of computer games, um, in the beginning, uh, that socializing aspect actually went away from games because um, the beginning of computer games actually were um, single player games where you had no chance of uh, socializing in-game. Um, but with the, uh, with the uh, internet and the connected world nowadays, um, socializing in-game gets easier. Um, but fellowship, what, uh, what, what LeBlanc said about fellowship um, is not just the socializing in-game, but also the, the building of a community or the feeling of being part of a community just around that game. And if you look at uh, the aspects or look at the possibilities you have, they are numerous, they are they're enormous. You could, okay, yes, uh, you could be together in-game, yeah? um, talk in-game, sit there and wait in-game, um, whatever. Um, you have electronic means of communication, um, you have certain forums, um, chat channels, whatever, where you can meet other players talk to them, um, and you could also build a community around your friends, yeah? you could, uh, that's what you do every Monday morning, you're talking about the games you played on the weekend, at least the students here, um, so uh, you, you talk about the games you played um, from person to person, and that is what he, what he means with fellowship, so game, games are some kind of social frameworks. Games offer a way to, to socialize, offer a way to, uh, to be together, uh, give a topic for, for talking, give a topic for, um, for socializing, and so on. Okay, number six, discovery. Um, this is the second part where, where in an obvious way we learn in games. Discover, seek and discover or seek and find something new. Um, and this is, this is um, what most people also say is the biggest fun in games. Discovering new aspects of the game, discovering new parts of the world uh, of the game, both exploring um, the whole world, finding hidden features, um, getting new abilities, working with these new abilities, playing with these new abilities. And even though um, I, I put up three very different examples, like um, this is Aeon, um, where you have like all those gray areas on the map that you haven't discovered yet and if you, if you go there then suddenly the map becomes clear and you know where it is and okay I have to discover a, a new piece of land and I learn something new uh, or um, when, you, when you unlock uh, new uh, abilities in game and you, um, in this case you got a new job and you got new, uh, new abilities you can uh, fight better or whatever um, or <coughs> even games with, like Candy Crush Saga, where you okay, there are these, these strange candies here. What do they do? And once you once you find out, you discovered something new. Oh, great! If I combine these two, then um, that just that happens. Um, you discover something new, and this is actually um, the, the the second way where you, in an obvious way, learn something. And uh, discovering something new, releasing of dopamine, feeling good, um, wanting more. This is the, the circle um, that is. So games um, should leave room to discover new things. Number seven, um, expression. 
Um, some people really want to express, or for some people it is really important to being able to express themselves and create things. Um, express themselves, um, creating things is often not connected actually with the goal of the game. So um, you saw that, that character before, um, two or three slides before, um, and that's the same character, just wearing different clothes. Um, so actually it doesn't matter what kind of cloth this character wears. Um, it could achieve the goal of the game with either or. Um, so, um, or like Farmville. Um, the aspect of Farmville is, well, I don't know what the goal is, but, <laughs> but what, what, I'm sorry. Uh, one aspect, there's actually no goal. Well, coming up with a um, plowing the land and uh, putting up seeds and, and harvesting foods um, over and over again in a cycle. Um, but you can do this without neatly arrange your farm that it looks nice. Yeah? But uh, a lot of people actually did arrange their farms so they look nice. And this was a big aspect of, of playing farm with who had the nicest uh, layout of their, of their farms or of their gardens. Um, so the uh, self-expression and um, think creating things is uh, often not connected with the goal itself. And um, it's not just the look and outfit of the character, but it's also the way how people play the game. You learn, a lot of, uh, you learn a lot about people um, when, when playing together with people. Um, how they react, how they play. Um, some of them are very polite, say hello and goodbye every time. Some of them are completely impolite, they don't say a single word to play with them together. Um, some of them are pre pretty rude, some of them are pretty polite. So um, you, you learn a lot about uh, people if you, if you see how they play, uh, if you see how they um, how do you react in games? So, um, as a game pleasure, um, games are a stage to uh, express yourself. And number eight, um, which is in the first glance, um, if you look at the word, it sounds a bit strange, submission. Um, submission means that um, you actually leave the real world behind. You leave the real world behind and enter into a well, a set of rules and a meaning that is probably more enjoyable. That you probably like better than um, being at university or being at home and uh, um, helping your mother clean the kitchen or... Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it is probably more enjoyable helping your mother clean the kitchen than being at university. Ever, but um, yeah, submission means that um, just you leave your real world, you, sub you suspend your disbelief and saying, okay, magic? No, magic is not real. Well, I don't care. I'm living in that, in that game world, or I'm, I'm, I'm feeling in that game world where magic happens. And I know that magic happens, and, and with, with, uh, with the magic cap capabilities I have, um, I can, whatever, I can um, damage people, I can... Um, Heal people. I can um, I can do whatever I want because I can do magic. So and I'm um, that 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 disbelief that you have magic isn't true or magic can't happen. If, if you suspend this disbelief, then you're really uh, into what what the submission means. Then then you actually um, you uh, adhere to the rules of the game world without thinking about, and um, this is what also another word would be immersion. You're in that game world, you're feeling in that game. So um, you leave the real world behind, the university, your mother was in the kitchen, um, and that's number eight. So um, if you just recap for these, these eight things, um, games should provide rich sensory input. Games need to leave space for imagination. Um, should tell a story, be challenging, um, be seen as a social framework. Um, should be uncharted territory with room to explore, uh, to exploration or to discover new things. Provide a stage to express yourself and provide actually a place to leave the real world behind. So these are the eight most, game, uh, most important game players in the Blanc. 
found out, but actually there's more. There is many more. Um, there are many more pleasures where people can get fun out of it. Humor. You're all probably laughing about Monty Python, uh, which is not a game, but, uh, but this is, this is uh, pretty nice humor um, for some of us. Um, anticipation is, is one of these, these uh, pleasures, or a surprise, thrill, um, triumph, triumph, and so on. And always remember, different people um, enjoy different things. So, um, things I enjoy, games I like, or things I like in games, do not necessarily have the same what you like, or you like, or whoever likes. Um, and uh, these eight game pleasures are actually um, thought as a guiding framework for, um, for some, if not all, aspects of game design, actually. Um, uh, LeBlanc said this is, this is the, the guiding framework for all aspects of game design, or I said for some. Um, so if you're looking at these game pleasures and figuring out, okay, I want to meet this, uh, I want to make a game which is sensory rich, sensory rich, and um, then I know that uh, at least a big amount of people will like the game because they like the good graphics and they like good music. And in the end, um, the ultimate, or ultimately, the job of a game is to give pleasure. Just to, I, I'm, I'm rep keep repeating myself, those games are all about fun. The job of a game is provide pleasure, but it's true. If you create a game which is not fun, nobody would buy the game. Nobody would play the game. So, um, in all aspects, um, fun is in the, uh, in the first uh, place. And in the uh, rest of my talk, I, I just want to talk about language pleasures. I just call it language pleasures. So, how does language fit in there? Um, these, these are more general um, things about games I, I've been talking about now. But how does language fit in there? Um, actually, um, with language, humans have one of the most powerful tools to provide pleasure and fun. Um, language is the, one of the most powerful communication tools, if not that communication tool. Um, and. Uh, you have so many possibilities with language to, um, to provide pleasure and fun. Um, you have written language. We're going to see an example here. You have spoken language. We, we, we heard one in the beginning. Um, you have this, this conflict or this, this uh, distinction between foreign languages and native language. Um, I like French, even though I, I don't speak it very well. But I like the sound of it. I like this, this, this music, rhythm, whatever, in, in the French language. Other people say, well, French, no. Um, I know you, you, you are French, so... Um, um, not, not, that's, that's not why I said I, I like French, but... Um, but uh, I will not do my presentation in French, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> <Not a> pity. <laughs> Um, but I, had, I have had arguments with people when I said, oh, I, I like the French language. How could you? <laughs> um, people like German language, some people dislike the German language, and so on. Um, yeah, spoken language, the sound of a, of a foreign language, the, the sound of the, uh, the rhythm of the language, this is something you can find. Even made up languages. Um, you can learn Klingon, actually. Um, the Star Trek. Uh, race, um, um, the Klingons, anyway. Um, there, there is a dictionary, there is a grammar, uh, you can actually take courses in Klingon. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can learn Esperanto, which is a completely made up, made up language. They are fun. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien actually, um, actually um, built a language like the, for the, the Alps. Uh, Alps, 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 Alps. Else. Okay. Um, in, in Lord of the Rings, I always keep mixing those two up. Um, in Lord of the Rings, actually, he created a language for them. Uh, with a grammar, with, with a vocabulary, with everything. Cool. So, um, in the next few slides, I'm going to give you a few examples of what you can do with languages in, game, in games. And what's important. In my point of view. I'm not a language person. Um, but, but you are the language people, so... Um, Number one, um, language has sensory pleasure. Rather, is the obvious. Always use correct language. Use correct spelling, use correct grammar, 
um, and so on. Uh, nothing is worse than reading a sentence which is not <coughs> correct. And even though my examples, there might be some non -correct, not, not correct sentences, I didn't write them. Um, I took them out of, out of the game. So, um, one example uh, you've, you've seen in the beginning, um, i just written down the, the text once again. Uh, beyond the human world was a hidden realm where the gods dwell. Um, how often did you hear the word dwell in English text? It's, it's pretty rare. Yeah? Um, playfulness, um, innocent spirits enjoying their lives in blissful. Um, this is just nice language. Or another example, um, once again from Final Fantasy, and once again a video um, just mind the language and watch the language and... Five years since that fateful day, since the seventh Umbral Era changed the world forever. The time has come for the heroes to return. On a windswept isle in the southwestern corner of the realm. Amidst the roiling waves of the Rotano Sea lies the maritime city state of Linsa Luminsa. To this haven for bandits and brigands, cutthroats and curs, seekers of both freedom and fortune, comes a lone adventure. Lone yet not alone, for the hero's arrival has drawn the gaze of the nation's patron deity, Lim Lane. What realm-shaking fate has she described in the churning waters of this mortal's future? Through peril and hardship, discovery and triumph, may the navigator guide this brave soul on his life's voyage. Till sea swallows all. Again, um, if you, if you, uh, there, there are many words I've never heard for a long time. Like uh, um, amidst the roiling waves, amidst, um, uh, um, people have tried to to make this language sound nice, to make make very a, a nice, interesting um, um, sound, interesting language. Like it. So a pleasant language. That was the uh, first example. Um, second example. Um, language should match the game, and actually um, I have that many examples, of that. I have a concrete example here, but the obvious is language should actually match the, um, the setting, the time, and the audience. For example, in a futuristic, outer space setting, um, you would not uh, like, you would not be likely, uh, you would not like to hear some medieval um, language. So futuristic, outer space uh, game, it's probably better, uh, there's probably better to have some kind of technologically oriented language and stuff like this. Or in a medieval game, um, you, you just expect to, to have some, some Latin or medieval terms or some, some ancient uh, terms or um, some terms which are not actually used nowadays, not anymore nowadays. Or an obvious example number three, a game which is for young children would use a completely different language than, than a game which is for adults. Um, you have to address young children um, with completely different, in a completely different language than you um, address uh, adults. So, but this is, this is more or less obvious, by the way. Um, these numbers here, um, whoops, this, this way, um, these numbers here um, just should indicate what game pleasures are um, connected with them, just to, to give you an example. Okay, example number three. Um, language should tell a story. Well, the obvious is um, stories are told by language. 
Right? The story in game is told by language. Uh, but the bonus here is you can use the language to tell a completely different story or to com com tell additional stories. Um, you could choose to, to uh, use dialects. You could choose to use different jargon, um, different terminologies, um, which, which should be at least consistent throughout the, the language versions. But um, with these kind of techniques, you could uh, build up different side stories from, uh, from the main story. Um, for example, dialects or jargon. Um, if you're traveling through Germany, starting in the north, um, you hear people talking differently than um, people from the south. Um, as I'm looking at people north, south, whatever. Um, and people in Dresden um, talk completely uh, different. Um, but these great regional differences um, can be used in games. For example, once again, Final Fantasy XIV, um, there are um, there are beast tribes, um, like sylphs, kobolds, um, some kind of fishman, some kind of birdman, whatever. Um, and they all have their own jargon, their own dialect. Um, and I tried to uh, look it up through the various um, language versions, um, if this is the way, or if it's the same in the various language versions. And I came up with Actually, my favorite sentence in that in that game. It's the uh, the most. Uh, I was I was so laughing uh, uh, when I saw this. Um, the, the context is you have a, a quest to to um, fulfill where you have to free one of these sylphs um, from a carnivorous plant. So there's almost eaten by a carnivorous plant. You have to destroy the plant and um, free that that small um, animal-like creature. And um, what that small animal-like creature um, says afterwards uh, is the most fun in German. Um, wenn die Deinige nicht gekommen wäre, wäre die Meinige wohl zur Rohkostigen geworden. Um, the fun thing is, the way um, the uh, game designers uh, let those uh, selves speak is, die Deinige, die Meinige, die Abenteuerige, der, der uh, Rohkostige, der Laufende, um, der, der Singende, der Tollpatschige. Um, so you have all these, uh, this very distinctive jargon that these, uh, these guys use. Okay, I looked it up in, in English and um, in French and English. Um, it's the walking one, this one, that one. It's also some kind of distinctive, uh, distinguished uh, language. In French, I think the, the main uh, part here is some kind of rhymes. Um, I don't see if these. Uh, <laughs> I I don't I have I don't know the game and I haven't seen it. The, the French translation is very boring. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, actually, actually, I didn't want to say it because some French people are here. Uh, the, the French is just well, I know you know like, if you wouldn't have saved me. Thanks for saving me from that um, unlucky event. I think it's a great example because it shows that yeah. like, it was an issue in French and they didn't know what to do with it, so they just ignored it. <laughs> okay, it might be, but at least it rhymes somehow. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at the Japanese one. I don't know Japanese, but I asked some, some people who uh, at least have some, some clue about Japanese when I asked them to translate. Um, and actually the Japanese version is also kind of funny, but first of all, um, there are some particles who actually uh, indicate that this is uh, not, not spoken language, there are some, some particles that, are, that give you um, a hint that this is special, uh, yeah, special way of speaking, like die Deinige, um, and there is something about land vegetables in there. So, uh, <laughs> so it's probably uh, <coughs> also, um, yeah, but uh, the point is not that this dialogue is funny, but the point is that um, with these distinctive um, ways of speaking, um, you create a story around these these beast tribes, around these these um, uh, animals, uh, animals, uh, animals, creatures, whatever. They have their own life, they have their own language, and um, they all talk like, like this and, and so on. And you you kind of again room for imagination. Um, you imagine them um, being a local group of people um, belonging together and whatever. So, example number four, um, discover a new language. 
Um, this is a fun one. Um, the obvious is you might encounter languages in, game, in games you've never heard of. Yeah? Made up languages. Yeah? These can be uh, written, spoken, uh, whatever. And the bonus is use these languages. Create them in, in some kind of way that, that actually makes sense. Um, might be written, might be spoken, um, might be uh, might be everything. Um, what what they did is um, it's it's pretty hard to see, but um, the written alphabet of the Eorzean language is basically English with some. Uh, some strange lettering. Um, some letters are uh, mirrored, some letters are kind of different, but this, this says Revenant's Fault. Um, and if you know what it means, you can read it. Um, this says Coethus uh, Central Highlands. Um, if you know what it means, you can actually read it. But it's a made up language, it's a made up written language basically. You can understand it, and it's, it's, it's great. You, you discover, whoa, this is a language, I can read it. And, Fun, positive emotions. Yeah. Um, and you can even go uh, this far that you build up a, a grammar and lettering for this language. And actually, the, um, the head localization um, officer of Final Fantasy XIV, Makakoji Fox, um, he uh, tells a lot about his job, but he tells a lot about what they actually do to make Final Fantasy XIV such a great experience. And he, um, he actually explained once that um, the sylphs, I've been talking about uh, the slide before, like the uh, Dining, the Meinige, uh, um, they have a certain way of being named. Um, all other beast tribes also have a certain way of, of uh, being named. And one of the beast tribes, the Exali, this is um, these are bird people. Um, he actually defined how they are named. And he said, okay, they, they have a first name and a clan name or a family name. The first name um, has two factors. The first factor is um, gender and the second factor is the direction of the wind, uh, the direction f uh, in which the wind was blowing at the time of birth. So then um, for, for male uh, individuals, uh, you can have these, uh, these suffixes um, that define the, the wind direction. For female uh, individuals, you have these, and then you have uh, one letter which is added to the to the name uh, which is uh, given by the family, and you come up with these names like Sutali Huelok. So Sutali, uh, Utali, uh, where is it? Uh, Utali. Well, there was Norman was blowing um, at the time of her birth, and S is uh, given by her family, and that's the final name. So and, and so. To make this game really consistent, to make the world consistent, he actually came up with his grammar rules, he came up with syntactic rules, he came up with, with stuff to, to actually define kind of a new language. Um, and once you discover this, um, again, you learn something, you got uh, positive emotions out of it, and um, you had fun. Um, and for like, uh, for like <laughs> and probably the last example. Um, <laughs> Uh, it happens once in a while. Um, probably the last example, um, you can language, you can use language to establish a relationship to, your, to the players. Um, the obvious is you use language in dialogues. But the way is, how do you use language in dialogues? Um, first of all, um, you have to treat the player politely, politely and with respect. Um, you don't say, hey, what are you doing? You, I'm not going to. Any further. But, um, for example, es tut mir leid, dich nach dem harten Kampf gleich wieder mit einer Bitte zu überfallen. Okay, you, you, you respect that he actually means rest or she, but okay, I have another, I have a matter that needs to be solved. Please help me. So it's respectful, politely. Um, it's um, a bonus number two, and this is this is really great. Um, remind the player of recent victories and lots of fails. Um, so, I mean, sometimes it's actually going on my nerves how often I, I was told in, in Final Fantasy that I am the warrior of light and I have uh, whatever. Um, but on the other hand, um, once in a while knowing that, wow, I 
actually, yes, yes, you did that. You did that. You are great. Um, that keeps the motivation, um, keeps uh, keeps the will to play the game. And actually, we should uh, um, we should include that in, in our um, teaching. Um, we should remind students that you actually pass the screen mathematics, so you will you will. Um, you will also pass uh, stochastics or whatever, and you passed uh, localization one, so um, it should be no problem. You are the hero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, I have heard much and more of your exploits. By your hand, the black wolf is slain, and his ultimate weapon destroyed, and so on. You possess the strength and courage, so make him feel valuable. Basically. Um, and number three, um, increase challenge but not fear. Um, I could say, okay, um, I have task for you. I have you. I want you to fight that enemy. That enemy is so strong that nobody before has ever managed to to fight that enemy. Well, even that it's true. I would never ever tell this to somebody. Write that uh, discrete mathematics test. This test is so hard that nobody before has ever passed that test. Okay, so you guys from the first semester, will you ever write a test? No. Um, yes, that is a challenge. Yes, it is hard. But there are people who manage it. And you can do it. You have the knowledge, you have the power, you can do it. And that's the same here. Du hast die Mühe, die Kraft, einmal kurz zu erforschen und den Albtraum einher zu gewinnen. Increase the challenge, or tell him it's a challenge, but don't make him fear. Um, but maybe okay, these are five examples um, to, and if I'm going to wrap this up, um, I actually managed to stay within that hour, that's great. Um, to wrap things up, um, I always want to sleep with this in my, uh, in my thoughts. The ultimate job of a game is to give pleasure. And everything that you do when designing a game and developing a game and creating a game is Think about the pleasure that you can provide with that game. Um, language is just one part. Um, that's what people usually say. Well, language. Mm -hmm. We need graphics that that is marvelous. That is uh, that, that only the, the best graphics cards can handle. Um, we need sound. Okay, we, we need to burn in symphony orchestra. Let's let's uh, record the soundtrack. Whatever. Um, but language is, in my point of view, an important part. And I'm not saying this because there are so many um, localization people. Um, the most important part is that you use language correctly. Um, nothing is worse, uh, nothing is more distracting than uh, false texts, false language in the game. Um, and the, the most important from a design point of view is use language um, for storytelling and basically to enhance immersion. And now you can pick these eight game plans and say, okay, uh, how can we use language to, to increase fellowship, to encourage fellowship? How can I use language to increase challenge? How can I use language to increase uh, narrative, whatever? And then think about when you translate a game and your task, your task in that contest um, will be to translate a game. Um, and again, Michael Koji Fox, the head translator from Final Fantasy, once said, uh, what they're going to do is they actually they give the Japanese version, that there is a Japanese version, and um, the Japanese version is actually not translated, well, they, they is translated, yes, but they give their um, localization people um, the liberty to actually tell the story in their language. Um, and that's actually what you can see in many dialogues. Like, for example, you, they came up with, with a language for their, for their beast tribes, even though the French is boring, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, they came up with different languages for beast tribes and so on, but they let the, uh, the localization people not translate the game, but actually localize the game. Um, and you can you can actually uh, feel this when playing the game. So tell the story in the in, in your language, 
given by or, or guided by the story from the game design and from the original version. That's my talk so far, and uh, for we've had just a few laughs. Um, so I actually um, <laughs> went into the web yesterday and was looking up something that should not never ever happen to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, for your Best talk. Shot. Because um, I think you emphasized already on two, for me especially, two aspects, fun and language. And linguistically, uh, a game is something completely different compared to technical documentation, for example. And um, yes, uh, a translation mustn't be boring and has to be very creative and therefore in localizing a game transcreation sometimes is uh, um, needed instead of pure translation and I think we saw uh, some very interesting examples so thank you very much I don't know whether there are questions please um, answer them here oh if you answer the questions great. Uh, <laughs> And uh, if not, we have um, the opportunity yeah. to talk to each other in uh, small rounds. And we have a small break before we continue our program. So far, thank you very much. Thank you.